On this Thursday night, yet another glitch in delivering the vaccine to Canada. How did the Liberal government let things get so bad? How this country keeps falling behind as others forge ahead. COVID-19 compounds the crisis for the homeless. How many homeless got to die before somebody wakes up and does something? The drastic measures overwhelmed and understaffed shelters are taking. And the calls to boycott the Beijing Olympics. Somebody has to break that uh, cycle of uh, retaliation and bullying. Why Canada isn't on board. Global National with Donna Friesen. Reporting tonight, Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. We begin with Canada's rocky vaccine rollout. After weeks of shortages, the government is warning provinces more disruptions are on the horizon. This week's Moderna shipment was slashed by more than 20%. Now the government says the next shipment will also be reduced. But it doesn't know by how much or why the cutbacks are happening. As of today, just over 1 million doses have been administered across Canada. About 2.6% of the population has received at least one dose. That is far behind many other countries. But the military general leading Canada's rollout says he's confident the government will make up ground. This is a long game. And as we discussed before, uh, the ramp up planning is ongoing. Phase two of the vaccine rollout, the ramp up, uh, we'll see a significant increase in vaccine supply across Canada. Abigail Beeman has tonight's top story on the roadblocks and the reassurances as Canada struggles with its vaccination campaign. We are now 34th in the world in the vaccination of our population. Let that sink in, Mr. Speaker. 34th and dropping. 34th, with news of another shipment shortage. Thursday's Moderna delivery had 22% less than originally planned. The next shipment on February 22nd will be cut too, but Canadian officials say we don't know by how much and we don't know why. The quantities that we expect to receive uh, remain to be confirmed by uh, the manufacturer. So at this time, I, I can't really tell you what the quantity will be, uh, but we do not expect to receive 249,000. News of a different kind of delay, too. After the procurement minister assured everyone the special syringes that help get six doses instead of five out of a Pfizer-BioNTech bottle were coming this week. Two million or so. And then uh, the long ago testing. Anita Anand didn't mention they need to be tested first, meaning provinces will have to wait longer to use them. By February 15th, according to our estimation, we'll be in a, we'll be, uh, in a position to distribute how did the Liberal government let things get so bad? Why didn't they do what the UK did, instead leaving us entirely dependent on other countries? Our vaccine contracts specify quarterly deliveries only. Testifying at committee, Anand revealed one detail of the highly secretive vaccine contracts. Manufacturers only have to meet delivery requirements every three months. She also said the government pushed all vaccine manufacturers about producing vaccines in Canada, like the deal just announced with Novavax, but the rest decided Canada's capacity was too limited. PSPC frequently, forcefully and aggressively brought this issue to the table, raised it, with the manufacturers. Beyond not yet knowing the total doses we'll receive three weeks from now, provinces know nothing about next month. Fortin acknowledges how difficult that makes rollout planning and says he'll be able to share details with provinces soon, about the first week of March. But like much of Ottawa's vaccine plans, he says that will be done in confidence. Abigail Beeman, Global News, Ottawa. The Canadian government is urging patients, but other regions are racing ahead with widespread vaccinations. Eric Sorensen looks at how other countries are doing and why Canada is facing criticism for dipping into a special global pool of vaccines. Vaccines are coming, but in Canada, it feels like the conveyor belt is grinding to a halt. A slower rollout is one thing, but falling behind other countries is another. The UK and the US are racing ahead with vaccines per capita. Both countries have large domestic manufacturing capabilities. Other G7 countries are behind. Around 3 per 100 vaccinated so far, Canada at 2.6 and likely to lag further as manufacturers cut back on supplies. The EU is feeling the same frustration. Nous, Européens, 
devons aussi... We Europeans should be more efficient, said France's president. And Germany's goals are almost identical to Canada's. By the end of the third quarter, said Chancellor Angela Merkel, we can offer a vaccine to everyone. But most countries haven't started vaccinating at all. And some experts say it shouldn't be a competition. We're only going to get through it if the whole world gets through it. And so as a result, we need to be focused not only on the race to be the most vaccinated in Canada, but this is actually a race that we all have to run together. Still, a sign of Ottawa's ambition to keep up was its decision to draw from the first supply of vaccines from COVAX, the international agency where wealthier nations share vaccines with lower income nations. Our government will never apologize for doing everything in our power to get Canadians vaccinated as quickly as possible. It's all above board. Canada has committed $440 million to COVAX, half to pay for up to 15 million doses for this country. The other half is for vaccine doses for low- and middle-income countries. But to be at the front of that line? Oxfam is angry. The aid agency says receiving one or two million doses isn't going to solve Canada's vaccination challenges, and it is going to cause harm elsewhere. It is very surprising because Canada is the only G7 uh, country that is pulling in on this deal. Are they breaking rules? They're not. Is it, Does it raise ethical questions? Yes, it really does, actually. Canada has already ordered the most vaccine doses per capita in the world and somehow is in the position of both wanting as many vaccines as it can get and seemingly falling behind in actually getting them. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. With the growing spread of highly infectious variants, Britain has launched a trial to determine if COVID-19 vaccines can be mixed. Volunteers will be given one shot of the AstraZeneca vaccine, followed by a booster of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, or vice versa. The first of its kind trial will assess immune response, not the overall efficacy of shot combinations. Preliminary results are expected around June. A positive outcome could help vaccines roll out with greater flexibility around the world. AstraZeneca is still under review in Canada. After months of rising case numbers, there are signs of progress in Canada's Indigenous communities. According to Indigenous Services Canada, over the last week, the number of active cases on reserves has dropped by more than 50 percent. Less than 2,000 people on reserves are currently infected. That's the lowest number since early December. And the government says it's making headway, getting vaccines into Indigenous communities. We're still on track to meet our end of March objective of having administered both doses of the vaccine to 75% of people in regions that are considered at higher risk. People are being urged not to let up on public health guidelines while vaccines are being rolled out. Cruise ships won't be returning to Canadian waters anytime soon. The government has extended its ban on ships with more than 100 people until February 2022. Canadians are being urged to avoid all travel on cruise ships outside Canada until further notice. New federal travel rules are now in place at Canada's airports. International flights are now restricted to four airports, Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto and Montreal. It's part of a push to discourage travel and slow the spread of new variants. The government says it will soon impose mandatory testing and hotel quarantines. In Toronto, at least 20 residents of a large homeless shelter have tested positive for the virus. City officials say they've all been moved to a recovery centre while they try to curb the outbreak. Homeless people are struggling everywhere right now, including Quebec, where it's bitterly cold. Shelters have reached capacity in Montreal, a crisis that has also turned deadly. There are growing calls for the government to step up and help, but as Amanda Jelowicki reports, it's an uphill battle. A homeless man anxiously peeks inside this new overnight warming tent in downtown Montreal. It's, not bad in here. It be a bit it's a place to sip a coffee, relax, and survive the bitter overnight cold. The truth is, there will be others who, who will die unnecessarily. He's referring to Raphael André, the homeless Innu man the tent is named for. He died last month, found frozen in an outdoor toilet. Homelessness is no joke. How many people got, how many homeless got to die before somebody wakes up and does something? Andre's death has brought to the forefront a crisis affecting Montreal's homeless like never before. With strict COVID rules limiting capacity, shelters are overflowing and short-staffed. It 
is a, a very, very, very strong and tough situation right now and severe. The city scrambled and built two emergency shelters. Even those extra beds aren't enough. We just opened this emergency space and it is already full and we are refusing people already every night. Space good. Some shelters have purchased igloos, self-contained tents to keep street sleepers warm and alive. This is a miracle, man. For real, uh, for everyone, man. Well, that's it. With COVID hitting homeless and shelter workers hard, public health has prioritized vaccinating the community. Homeless advocates say compounding all this stress, a fight with Premier Francois Legault to exempt homeless from the 8 p.m. curfew. Friends say Andre was hiding from police the night he died. They're scared. They're scared to open a toilet here, let's say, and there's somebody in there dead. As for the warming tent, advocates say more are needed. It's really important, right, uh, that, you know, the people that are on the streets get the services and no one else passes away. Because with winter far from over, they fear what happened to Andre could happen again. Amanda Jelowicki, Global News, Montreal. New details are emerging tonight around allegations involving Canada's former top soldier, General Jonathan Vance. He's facing allegations of engaging in inappropriate sexual behavior in the Canadian Armed Forces. Military police are now investigating the case. Global News first reported allegations that Vance had an intimate relationship with a female subordinate, including during his time as chief of the defense staff. It is also alleged that he propositioned a junior officer in 2012 before his appointment. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson joins us now with the developments. Mercedes. Robin, Global News has learned that the Canadian Forces National Investigative Service, the military police who handle sensitive cases, have launched an investigation into the allegations against General Jonathan Vance after meeting with one of the women today. Global News has also learned that Defence Minister Harjit Sajjan's office knew in 2018 of concerns about the behaviour of Canada's top soldier. Two government sources tell Global News the Canadian Forces Ombudsman at the time, Gary Walborn, brought those concerns to the Minister's office, leaving Sajjan, quote, concerned. A senior government source also told Global News that Sajjan's office referred the matter to the Privy Council office, believing they were the appropriate authority. But what happened after that is still unclear. Sajjan was grilled today in question period, asked by Conservatives to confirm whether he briefed the Prime Minister. I have always ensured that any allegations that are brought to my attention have been, re have been reported to the appropriate authorities to begin an investigation regardless of rank or position. A senior government source says the Prime Minister and his office were unaware of concerns about Vance and the allegations facing him before they were reported by Global News. Vance denies all allegations of inappropriate behaviour. In the meantime, there are growing questions about how Vance was vetted in 2015 by the Harper government before his appointment as Chief of the Defence Staff. And what all these allegations could mean for Operation Honour, the military's mission to stamp out sexual misconduct, which Vance was the face of. Uh, no matter how well-intentioned and how uh, valuable that effort has been to date with Operation Honour, um, you know, this kind of an allegations, I, I think, can only really seriously undermine something uh, that seemed to be uh, very important over the last several years. Mercedes, you reported that the subordinate officer says Vance has consistently been trying to call her multiple times a day since you broke the story. What else have you learned about their communication? The woman says she has felt pressured by Vance to say certain things that she says are not true like that they didn't have sex. Vance acknowledged to Global News that he has called the woman, saying, absolutely we have spoken, but I am not pressuring her. Vance also said he has not asked her to say anything untrue. And as far as that concern about abuse of command authority and having a relationship with a subordinate, Vance has denied a sexual relationship. He says that he and the woman are old friends and that despite his being chief of the defense staff while she was a junior officer, he does not, and I quote, feel in any way there is a power imbalance. Robin? Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. In the U.S., the Republicans are at war with themselves. Coming up, their contentious vote on whether to punish a Georgia lawmaker. 
Former U.S. President Donald Trump won't testify at his impeachment trial next week. His lawyers made that clear today. As for one of Trump's biggest backers, the House of Representatives has now voted to remove Marjorie Taylor Greene from her committee assignments. Let's bring in our Washington Bureau Chief Jackson Prosco. Jackson, how significant is that? Well, Robin, this is unprecedented that they would take steps like this against a member of Congress, but it comes as the Republican Party grapples with the role of conspiracy theorists in its own ranks and the lingering influence of former President Trump. I was allowed to believe things that weren't true. Seeking distance from her own well-established beliefs, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene made a defiant plea but offered no apology. Will we allow the media that is just as guilty as QAnon of presenting truth and lies to divide us. Green's tumultuous first month in office has been defined by her years spent promoting conspiracy theories, from QAnon to bizarre anti-Semitic claims about space lasers. Why are you supporting red flag gun laws that attack our Second Amendment rights? She harassed survivors of school shootings and claimed the tragedies were staged. And you have nothing to say. Do you have any regrets? In the weeks following the storming of the Capitol, calls for Green to face consequences have only grown louder. She claims uh, that Speaker Pelosi is guilty of treason and then says, quote, it's a crime punishable by death is what treason is. Nancy Pelosi is guilty of treason. We denounce anything that we've seen that was said in that past. And when Republicans refused to strip Green of her committee assignments, Democrats decided to use their majority to do it. All the while, Green has used the controversy to fundraise, with the continued support of former President Donald Trump. I think what it says is that people think they can win elections by using this messaging. This former Republican congressman sees dangerous days ahead. In a closed-door caucus meeting on Wednesday, it was Republican Liz Cheney, not Green, who came under fire because of Cheney's support for impeaching Trump. I just don't think you're going to see a whole lot of accountability for the awfulness on January 6th. Uh, with leaders who spread disinformation. As Republicans claim Green shouldn't be punished for her conduct before she was elected, they're also preparing to argue that a now former president can't be punished for his conduct while in office. Despite Trump's refusal to testify before the Senate impeachment trial next week, it is still possible he may face a subpoena from the Senate for his testimony. It's also just as likely that they'll use his refusal to speak as evidence against him as that impeachment trial gets underway next week, Robin. Jackson Prosco in Washington. Thanks, Jackson. Still ahead, empty front pages lay out a dire message about Canadian journalism. Did you notice something a little strange when scanning today's headlines? In some cases, they were blank, not because there was no news to tell. It's all part of a new campaign launched by News Media Canada. The association represents the print and digital media industry and is calling on Ottawa to take action and impose laws against tech giants like Google and Facebook from taking news content from Canadian publishers and profiting without paying. It's uh, something that they've agreed to do in, in France and they are, we're working towards it in Australia. So we think we need a Made in Canada solution here. You can find out more about the call to action on our website. That's globalnews.ca slash globalnational. Up next, the bid to boycott Beijing's Olympics and why the Canadian Olympic Committee isn't on board. The president of Tokyo's Olympic Organizing Committee has apologized, but refuses to resign over sexist remarks. 80-thrilled Yoshiro Mori said women talk too much and that meetings with female directors can drag on because everyone ends up saying something. Mori has since acknowledged the comments were inappropriate. The countdown to Beijing 2022 is officially on. Today marks one year to go until the Winter Games in China, and officials unveiled the designs for the Olympic and Paralympic torches. But human rights groups are taking a stand tonight, calling for a boycott to the Games because of China's abuses against ethnic minorities and the detention of two Canadians. Crystal Gumansing reports. Beijing. <laughs> With the spotlight on China, activists fear the glimmer of gold will have people turning a blind eye to the country's human rights record. I was uh, in the same protest, or at least 
call for boycott in 2008. We all kind of kind of kowtow to what China wants us to do, and I think somebody has to break that、uh, cycle of、uh, retaliation and bullying. China recently clawed back freedoms for people in Hong Kong, freedoms protected under international obligations. There are documented cases with firsthand accounts of Uyghur Muslims being abused, even raped in Chinese camps, and the continued detention of Canadians Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor. I think our collective heart breaks for what's happening to them, and, and yet. Um, I think common sense should tell most of us that we're not going to、uh, embarrass the Chinese. We're not going to shame them into letting those two out of prison. David Shoemaker says his job is to support Canada's athletes, and he demonstrated that in an open letter, writing, "In no way are we at the Canadian Olympic Committee and Canadian Paralympics Committee trying to minimize what is happening in China, but a boycott is not the answer." Canada didn't go to the Moscow Games in 1980, and there have been many calls for boycotts since, including the 2014 Winter Games in Sochi and the 2008 Games in Beijing. When it comes to these games, the Association for Democracy in China says Canada shouldn't go. At least giving the people in China some hope that people care outside. Shoemaker lived in China and says he gets it, but Canada is going. We did want to make sure that the athletes understood. No, no, we're we're behind you.、Um, we don't think you should be used as pawns in a, a dispute among nations. A clear message for athletes, but one that won't silence critics of the games. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Thursday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is Spray Valley Provincial Park in Kananaskis Country, Alberta. We would love to see your corner of this country, so please keep sending your photos to viewers at globalnational.com. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you back here tomorrow. Have a great night.